Uh, yeah, so hello everyone, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Luca Gudek, uh, and I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on hacking the narratives of smart cities. Um, and this is actually the first of the two webinars that the Green European Foundation is organizing with the support of CDN um, and the financial support of the European Parliament to the Green European Foundation. And this webinar is also kind of a sneak peek into the live youth training uh, on technology in cities that we hope to organize later this year in Riga. Um, now, um, uh, maybe one more technical uh, announcement uh, or a request would be that everyone mutes themselves uh, so that we don't have any noise. Um, and also, if you have any uh, questions at any point during this webinar, you can write them. Uh, in the chat uh, or otherwise uh, at the end when we have the discussion you can write your name uh, in the chat and then we'll call you out and you can um, unmute and speak up. Um, so yes, first of all, uh, our agenda. Um, this webinar is separated into three parts. Um, in the first part we'll have a small introduction into uh, smart cities uh, in the broader uh, sense. Um, then we will go over uh, uh, in the second part, in the main part, uh, kind of uh, over the different narratives that exist on smart cities, on technology in cities. And in the last uh, part, we'll have some time for a discussion on uh, how we can uh, kind of uh, interpret and uh, uh, see through uh, more analytically through these different discourses that exist on technologies in cities. Uh, but first of all, um, we can uh, start by talking about uh, smart cities more broadly. Now, um, there are many definitions uh, and typologies of what a smart city even is, which is quite interesting. If you look it up, uh, it will be kind of hard to find one very universal definition. Um, and the reason for this is that different definitions of smart cities emphasize different aspects of a city. Some definitions um, kind of rely on better economic output, some on more efficient governance, and others maybe rely on better energy uh, sustainability in cities. However, what most of these definitions agree on is that smart cities are something very positive. And that has to do a lot with labeling. I mean, when you think about it, like what city wouldn't want to be labeled smart or intelligent. It's kind of like a win label that you can have. Um, and yeah, when it comes to this concept, uh, it isn't really new. However, in the academic research, it's still considered that there's not a lot of theoretical insights. There's not a lot of empirical research uh, and data on smart cities. Um, so uh, there was quite a nice uh, uh, site earlier this year when uh, Public Management Review, which is quite a prestigious uh, journal, published their special issue uh, edition exclusively on smart cities. And here they introduced quite an interesting um, idea that there have been um, kind of waves uh, or phases of uh, narratives on smart cities. Um, there were three of these phases, and the first one was very utopian. It was uh, like an idea that this merger of technology um, and the urban concept uh, was uh, kind of a milestone and a solution uh, to our social, environmental, economic issues. Uh, and then there was a second phase, which was a bit more critical, a bit more pessimistic, uh, and it was focused on exposing these innovations that were happening in cities as kind of a um, uh, kind of a hidden way of promoting the economic growth and any price without actually taking the needs of the wider society into account. And then their idea is that currently we're in this realistic phase um, where we talk empirically about cities and we try to have discussions that are actually based on relevant data. Uh, and this idea that the way that we talk about uh, smart cities uh, is the same uh, uh, at a point in time, but it changes through time. It's quite interesting. However, we didn't really agree with it based on our findings because we were kind of looking into the situation today and we realized that different actors actually talk differently about cities based on their interests. And so what we do at this webinar is exactly 
taking on this approach. We take a look at three different stakeholders. Uh, and first, we take a look at what kind of narratives on smart cities uh, exist in pop culture by bringing you some examples from novel series and movies. And then we talk about uh, quite an opposite perspective, different set of narratives that the corporations um, uh, have, what view they have of the urban environment. Um, and we take an example of alphabet here. And then we finish off by taking a look at quite an interesting evolution of newspaper articles uh, covering tech in cities. Uh, so uh, this is about it for our small topical introduction. Uh, and we can start with our first uh, part, smart cities in pop culture. Uh, and here, Hannah will take a floor. Uh, so over the past century, pop culture has been reinforced more during societal concerns that elevate about specific technology, challenging our assumptions and preconceptions about the role that products and services play in our everyday life. Meanwhile, the tech advancement has brought several expectations and fantasies, for example, the seemingly utopistic idea of artificial intelligence that turned out to be uh, in the middle of the 20th century more than ever realistic. Such a promising future vision has otherwise led to anxiety and fears, and those fears have encouraged Mars interest in dystopia, where the worst of these fears are brought into reality. And in, in fact, there are different explanations for the growing interest in this genre. And one of the most prominent one is linked to our real world fears and increased sense of vulnerability. In that case, dystopia fiction serves as a way for us to cope with a stressful reality, while stories that predict future speak to our any desire for control over our fate. And we want to focus in this part of the presentation is the visions of the future that have been proposed in some of the most popular works of fiction and look at what has driving these ideas or fears featured in them and see how or whether these visions uh, shape our present. Uh, so when does the extent of interest in dystopia start from? It is believed to be the beginning of the 20th century associated with the First World War, which scales seriously affected the perception of foreign culture. That is why post-war period will be our starting point uh yeah well uh, post-war rights of dystopias reflects the pessimism associated with the helplessness of person in the face of weapons and abusive power of state and if, if there is one book or movie that best foretells what humanity could become it is probably the famous aldous huxley's novel brave new world one of the major themes in this uh, work is the warning huxley satirically communicates about how much control society should give to technology. His story takes place in the year of 2540 when children are engineered uh, in artificial worms and sorted into castes based on their intelligence and physical abilities. Most adults, meanwhile, are on mind soothing drugs, and those who reject those practices are exiled to remote uh, and resource poor uh, locations, which are closely monitored by the world state government. Meanwhile, that government uh, justify that their implementation of science is for all for the cause of progress and exploration. However, the reality is bettering technology for the desire to control society, which aims at a constant consumption. And the second example is 1984 by George uh, Orwell. Published in 1949, it describes a future where global despotic power controlled the people of uh, so-called Oceania with surveillance and propaganda. It depicts a dark future where technology exists in the public realm only as a tool for elite to control society. The work also serf serves as a warning against absolute power uh, of all kinds, against the manipulation of language, against the loss of independent thought and one's privacy. And in this dystopia, surveillance then Every world is monitored, unacceptable speech is deleted, history is rewritten or deleted altogether, and individuals can uh, become unpersons for holding views disliked by those in power. And as many now say, it turns out that uh, the author's predictions were frankly accurate in one way or another. 
Uh, now let's move to another milestone period in the dystopian rise, which was uh, 1960s to 2000s, where scientific and technological progress were uh, driving dystopia. Dystopians of the 1950s and 1960s were empowered by the concerns of the, the inventions of that time, like the invention of the Turing test, the launch of an artificial satellite, the creation of computer, a human space flight. And one of the most remarkable works of that period is Philip Dick's novel, Do Androids Dreams of Electric Sheep, which was adapted into the well-known movie Blade Runner. Set in 1992, the story follows the systematic annihilation of rebellious androids in a post-apocalyptic uh, San Francisco. The work is, re is respected hugely to this day for its astute insights on the future of man and machine, for example, uh, AI advance advancement with smart robots and such technolo technologies like deepfake or the idea that people easily bond with uh, technologies. At the same time, in a nutshell, the book is a meditation on how the unique and fragile experience, uh, human experience, might be damaged by technology created to serve us, as well as the explorations what robots are capable of when given the chance. Meanwhile, dystopias throughout 1970s, 2000s start uh, rising issues of ecology and bioengineering technologies. It is also the time when cyberpan sitting appears. And a prime example of that genre is The Matrix, which is an American science fiction uh, film. That movie centers on a computer hacker now who learns that his whole life has been lived with an elaborate uh, simulated reality. And this computer-generated dream world was designed by an artificial intelligence of human creation which industrially forms human bodies for energy uh, while distracting them via a relatively pleasant parallel called the matrix and this sci-fi thriller became an instant pop culture phenomenon and in the years since it influenced on the industry and audiences has endured well the concept of the matrix uh, toyed with the important question what happens when the technology we create become smarter than us. And it only seems to grow in relevance as technology rapidly advances. Uh, and now let's move to some modern examples of pop culture. Yeah, indeed. Uh, the way in which these discourses evolved uh, later on uh, uh, kind of took a more, uh, let's say, realistic direction. Um, and uh, this phase basically happened from 2010s on. And here we can talk about modern dystopias uh, in pop culture. And kind of um, the landmark uh, movie and the series of books that happened here uh, was Hunger Games. Um, and here basically we had a story that presented technology being used to create a totally new social order that was based on castes, mass surveillance and oppression. And kind of all these characteristics of totalitarian regimes were being hidden by the entertainment industry and uh, the myths that existed were supported by technology. Um, and this was quite interesting because um, uh, this is something that we've seen happening in reality where we have um, this uh, like very nicely packaged uh, ideas uh, of technologies that actually turn out uh, can have a very negative effect in a way that they can um, like change the way that our society works. And this is what they try to present in the Hunger Games. Mm. And you could see it not only in these casts and uh, huge rooms uh, of, uh, of uh, scientists completely controlling uh, areas and environments, but also later on when there uh, surfaces a completely new uh, movement, resistance movement, they are also using this technology to, uh, uh, to kind of uh, create their own narrative uh, of what the new social order should look like. And then there was this uh, photo that you can see here in the bottom uh, of the main protagonist uh, standing with a flag in a battlefield. And in reality, she's uh, standing somewhere in a studio with a pole, not really, um, yeah, not really uh, uh, being a part of this narrative that she's trying to present. Um, and then also another nice example 
uh, from this final phase and, uh, of uh, technology in pop culture is Black Mirror, uh, which I'm sure that you've heard about. Um, it's uh, also an American series uh, which um, presents very uh, realistic uh, in, in dystopias and very realistic ways of how technology could change uh, our society. Uh, and yeah, there was quite an interesting uh, episode in the series called Nosedive, which presented a near future in which everyone can rate uh, each other based on uh, based on their real life interactions. And then the score, uh, the cumulative score you receive from uh, all the people you interact with, um, can decide, uh, can determine which social um, uh, which social services you're allowed to access, uh, which groups of people you can socialize with, and so on. And um, of course, since since it's Black Mirror, it also it evolves uh, at some point where uh, the um, the main character goes crazy and ends up in jail, uh, which stops then perhaps being realistic, but kind of it's an interesting way of presenting um, like what very negative consequences these technologies that we take for granted and that we see as being very um, uh, like interesting but uh, also harmless how they can actually uh, affect our lives and change the way that we interact with others in the society um, and those were the three phases that Hannah and I presented of the narratives in pop culture um, and kind of the question is, what do we get out of it? What conclusions can we draw? Besides that there are kind of three distinct phases in this uh, development. Well, uh, we realize that even though the picture uh, that all these um, movies and books and series paint is quite bleak um, when it comes to the connection of technology and society, at the same time, they're kind of uh, presenting the marvels of technology and the dangers that we could face from it. Um, and when they do it in a realistic way, it also kind of serves uh, as a, th uh, a thinking point uh, for us to have uh, and, and yeah, to kind of make us think actually we should uh, be very critical when applying these technologies into our societies. Um, but yeah, perhaps we can move on uh, to uh, the business sector um, and Bianca here prepared for us. Uh, yeah. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, I'm going to talk about like how smart city narratives are uh, present in businesses, uh, and like mainly, I would like to talk about the Alphabet Google example, like this sidewalk lab, sidewalk labs in Toronto. Uh, but at the same time, as you can see on the like on the map, uh, there are other corporations who are also interested in developing. Are, are like who are present in urban development and who are like interested in developing developing their idea of a future city and exploring and uh, having a vision. Uh, if you go one slide, if you go to the next slide, uh, you can see like um, this example of uh, sidewalk labs. So sidewalk la sidewalk labs is our high tech quarter in Toronto with with uh, four, fourteen. Uh, 49,000 square meters, and it's considered to be a laboratory for urban innovation. And as they promise, uh, I will read it out, they're promising, we're taking an integrated appro approach towards a more inclusive, affordable, and resilient future. So this is their vision. But how does it work? Next slide. Um, so as you can see, they're like, big businessmen behind that uh, and they're presenting the narrative of they're promising a more integrated sustainability, intelligent grids and feedback talk technology. So they want to lower the emissions, the energy costs and so on. And uh, they kind of promising that the grids are adapted to the needs of the citizen in real time. So if you need something uh, like sensors or something, they already know about it and they will just deliver it to your home. At the same time, everything is uh, interconnected and connected to a data platform that unites all data and makes it kind of more efficient. Uh, and also promise uh, that it's like about human scale. So everybody is like, so people first city. Uh, so everybody is really um, like considered or like the individual is considered to be the, the most important or 
thing and this whole concept. Uh, and uh, last but not least, like their intelligent transportation system. If you go to the next slide, you can see like the different layers of their alphabet uh, sidewalk labs. So you have the digital lever on the very top, which is like on the framework, like a framework, which is kind of like a network on everything. And then you have the different physical layers like buildings, mobility, public realm and infrastructure. And uh, what you can see is like, for instance, on the buildings that they um, they are planning a, like a modular building system so uh, that you can adapt it to uh, to the needs of of, yeah, to your own needs. If you're a small family, you probably want to have like a like a small uh, apartment, but with some additions. So it's like very modular, very flexible. The mobility system is like considered to be smart. So it's like, uh, and it's considered to create a new sustainable, so create, create new sustainable, sustainable mobility options. And like everything connects to mobility is also, I would say quite promising and quite interesting. Uh, because like we can already see it also in uh, like uh, not la non laboratory parts of our cities that uh, mobility is more, uh, more and more integrated um, and yeah and the it's also pr uh, promises also like smart government and smart governance so um, their citizen participation is promised and uh, also like they also promise more transparency in the public sector um yeah and like they they want to, to see the full potential integrated in everything um in this smart city and then the, on the very down you have the infrastructure and you can see it on the next si slide that uh, they separated the transportation system from the goods delivery system so the their their uh, sidewalk labs planned uh, an underground system for delivery goods so that everything that you don't really want to see like dumping waste and stuff like that is not um present in the public realm so problems or like problems or things that are not nice they are they're hidden so and this is also something you could discuss uh we could discuss is like do we really want this do we really want uh like this to be invisible and i'm going to my last slide um and remember reminding of um like the promises that we had kind of or the promises that i made to be inclusive affordable and resilient uh, i think probably resilient in the transportation sector this could be something a promise that they probably would reach but inclusive and affordable these are two big questions like inclusive because like like what is about the political political and social questions um like is it really super is it really that inclusive i mean it's probably very expensive to live there it's probably um not very uh yeah it's it's very exclusive i would say as it's expensive and as uh like the data collection is not really clear and uh you could for instance say that like for technology for technology companies it's interesting for these projects are interesting for them because uh they want to, they can explore their uh their, their new te their technology they can implement it and they can uh, take it to the next stage and the question is how much of value does it have actually for the for the public um and yeah and it's a ruined urbanity because like even though like they promise a modular system it's still very like it's uh, like there's not so much space for mixed use buildings there's not so much space for everything which is like not in their like not in the master plan they have uh, so this is like very questionable. Um, yeah. So to come to a conclusion, um, it's a very narrow vision of future cities. And like just uh, one last point before I come to the conclusion is um, that this kind of this example of alphabet is just one example of many, but it was the most prominent one. And it's actually uh, one who already failed because like. Uh, after like I think a couple of weeks ago like two or three weeks ago they announced that they're not going to do it because like of corona crisis and like because like they don't really know like how investment could go in the future and so on so uh, it's on hold or I probably even stopped so my conclusion or our conclusion for this part is 
Uh, so businesses in smart cities. So it's a very narrative vision of cities forming a normed urbanity and neglecting political and social questions for the benefit of the tech com companies who are actually using these pilot projects to improve the analytics and to be more efficient and to be more, uh, yeah, to, to be able to sell more of their products. Um, and like the question is if these, um, yeah, these, if this is really for the benefit for the for the people and not just only for corporations. And now we go to the next section. And I think Hannah is the one who's continuing. Yeah. So now, now we're, we're going to talk, talk about smart cities in journalism and the role of the media in shaping public perceptions. Uh, and opinions about significant political and social issues uh, has been long the subject of countless debates and discussions. It is widely uh, accepted that uh, what we know about, think and believe about what happens in the world outside of our personal first-hand experience is greatly shaped by how these events are reported in newspapers and other mediums. Meanwhile, the media can and does decide what it what is reported and these stories in whole or in part are assimilated and accommodated into the emotional fabric and cognitive structures of individual readers and viewers and how the media chooses to report and to comment on those events and issues also has an impact and influences the thinking of many and one of the tools of that impact is headlines front pages front page stories and news items that appear early in the newspaper are perceived as more important by both uh, newspaper editors and the public. And that is why the importance of headlines cannot be underestimated. It is widely recognized that many readers scan newspapers rather than read all of the news story. As a result, read readers who adopt this strategy rely on limited and often sensationalized information. And in view of, of these mentioned peculiarities, of, uh, we decided to explore the headlines and covers of the most influential magazines through the years and see how they have reflected on technologies. And um, to, do, to be able to do that, we'll um, show you, we'll lead you through a journey in time of different newspaper outlets and magazines uh, and how they're trying to portray not only smart cities, because we have to emphasize that smart cities as a concept is rather new, but however, the elements of smart cities are not. So we still talk about technology, used to talk about technology, or we uh, talked about the effects of computer in our society and in our cities. So the idea that we want to portray is that although smart cities is new, uh, the ideas behind it are not. So we start with uh, pre-1960s, we named it as such because there is, um, so it's a very wide uh, period, uh, but in fact, it's uh, there's not, of course, a lot of media outlets because uh, of the times. However, we see that one of the first moments that we start talking about uh, computer society or terminologies related to uh, um, computer and technology are, is discussion about the machine age. So this started in the 1920s, where uh, there were a lot of newspaper headlines talking about this new machine age. So what do we expect? And the, the, you can see that the language that is used is rather, um, um, although it, it raises questions, is rather uh, optimistic. So we talk about this new age of the machine and we talk about how our cities can look like. So the idea is to uh, bring the unimaginable, try to imagine the unimaginable in the eyes of uh, society. However, uh, through time, uh, this perception starts changing. So we see that in the next slide, um, from the 1960s to the 1920s, while in the society the computer moves in, uh, there's uh, first, questions raised about the effects of this um, in our in our cities but also in in general in the world so we can see that there is from time magazine you can see there's discussions about the high tech gap and also how um, it's um, how this uh, new technologies might influence our cities however uh, we can see that the discussion is still rather uh, 
broad. So we don't talk about smart cities or we don't talk about the relation of technology with cities very directly. And that's why we wanted to bring this forward because we think that although it's not that direct, it actually has a big impact on how people perceive uh, the uh, technology back then. Um, and as I said before, there's first concerns about the disadvantages or issues that computer society is bringing forward. And uh, there's first questions on how will we behave or how will we cohabit with the computers and what are they bringing to our society. However, I have to emphasize that again, um, if you see closely, uh, the ideas are still uh, very optimistic. So there's still this new tech magic world, new technology that is changing the way that we live. And uh, this is uh, seen in a rather positive light. Uh, then afterwards, because of the new inventions, of course, uh, in the 1990s, especially, we can see that from 1980s to 2000, we have a big um, uh, discussion not only about technology now, but uh, about the people behind it. So there is a lot of time uh, magazines covering uh, people like Bill Gates, Steve Jobs in their first uh, moments of um, achievement and success. And they're, um, and they're uh, considered now as masters of the universe, but not only masters of the universe, but also like the risk takers, uh, the genius man behind the ideas, the ones who, um, <clears throat> sorry, the ones who are bold and <clears throat> and uh, also have these uh, magic ideas brought before us, as you can see in one of the times um, covers, uh, Bill Gates is portrayed with this golden feather. Uh, and uh, Steve Jobs is portrayed as one of the risk takers. <clears throat> so we can see that uh, there is a shift of discussion on how these people are now actually ruling the world, maybe. I mean, this is, of course, something that I'm looking at in retrospective. So uh, it's um, the discussion now has, um, has changed. So we have more knowledge now and we can judge based on it. But we think that this is very important to discuss because um, the way that this has shifted uh, also portrays how the thought of people in the in the period has changed and how actually media frequently uh, shifts um, uh, what it reports or frequently uh, changes the way that it portrays different um, different happenings or occurrence in the world in order to kind of hack the narratives behind it uh, to show us what uh, we need uh, uh, there the way that they see the world but if this is true or not then that's the discussion that we want to have today however um we can also see that in this period the technology takes the upper hand so we have the strange world of the new internet but how uh, uh, and how there are battles on the frontiers of uh, technology and this is very obvious in the next uh, slide so in the next period that we have uh, um, discussed here which is post 2000s and we can see that we shift from um, masters of the universe now how they actually behave with each other let's say so we have uh, technology becoming so important that there are fights on it like cyber war and uh, uh, who owns the knowledge economy so who will be the new owners and what is the future of technology however in this period luckily in a way or fortunately we see more reflection on actually what is the impact or what is the influence of technology in our cities uh, there is a war there is a worrying character being portrayed in the media so what lies behind uh, <clears throat> these smart city technology? Do we really need them? Uh, do we really uh, need smart cities? Or maybe we need more dumb cities? I have to uh, stress that here also the discussion about smart cities as a term is more obvious. People are starting now to use the smart city term, not just technology or uh, computer society and so on. So uh, this. Uh, kind of portrays a shift where we have uh, more dynamics and more discussions on uh, uh, the impact of technology. And of course, in the later, this has changed more um, because we have, like, in the late 2020, like, earlier to now, like, 2020s, we have 
even more dynamics in the discussion of smart cities. However, uh, I have to, uh, um, to point out here that it's very, uh, the, the, the ideas are still portrayed somehow, sometimes in a positive note. Uh, if, um, uh, sorry, Luca, could you move one more? So we can see that, especially in the, in the case of the New Yorker magazine, while of course it's worrying, the, we think that the way that it has portrayed the, the cover of the magazine, which is a kind of a nice, fashionable magazine cover, uh, it kind of brings forward the idea that, okay, it's worrisome, but it's also exciting, uh, something that we need to look forward to and might change the way our society, and uh, it's uh, super nice and exciting. And, um, but However, there is also the, the worrying uh, behind it, like uh, in the Economist cover that you can see here, that every state you take is now monitored by these big high-tech industries. Uh, and uh, of course, there is raising concern about cyber attacks uh, and um, uh, privacy issues. Um, so basically, to wrap up, we said there is a mix of both positive and negative attitudes on, um, like, um, to, to consider both positive and negative advantages of technology. And we think that this is very important uh, to, to start discussing because uh, the idea that uh, behind why we brought media here is that we uh, want to understand what they are giving us as a narrative and how we can actually reflect critically upon it. Uh, for the next one, I invite Hannah again. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm going to just reflect on the words of Rui so that uh, what we have to stress once again is that media and public opinion have always been connected as the media play a significant role in mass communication and reflect the issues of the greatest concern to a particular society. And at the same time, as Rui told, uh, talking about in the context of technologies, we can observe this, the shift from positive slash utopistic to more of a negative and critical vision of tech throughout these years. And that is the first shift. And the second shift is that we can observe that the press and media do not simply reflect reality nowadays, but they also play their part in filtering and shaping it. And here comes the question of a power of media, where is the line between shaping the way we see the world uh, and shaping the world itself by bringing up and focusing on particular issues. Um, yeah, and on this note, I give a word to Luca for him to open up discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you, Hannah and Derisa. So yeah, those would be our three uh, kind of overviews of three different narratives that exist um, uh, that exist uh, around uh, smart cities and even though like all these three narratives um, uh, the pop culture narrative the business narrative the media narrative they're all different uh, you can see that today what they have together is that through time they evolve uh, they've all kind of sharpened or advanced very much uh, like in the pop culture you could see um, that uh, these narratives about smart cities and about technology used to be very, um, uh, very broad. And even though uh, they were critical and they were kind of dystopian, um, uh, like they started to criticize uh, also the effect of technology on our society very practically um, and thinking in not so outrageous uh, terms a lot of the times, even in uh, recent years, how this technology that we have um, could actually change our uh, societies um, from the ground up. Um, also in the business, you can see that uh, even though these uh, companies have very narrow visions uh, of what a city should be and um, and when they present their projects, they have they don't really take into account much of uh, social justice in a lot of the cases. Um, you heard also that Bianca was talking uh, a lot about how um, Alphabet was trying with this uh, in, uh, project in Toronto to actually uh, try to be transparent and uh, to promote some participation. Um, even though you might uh, criticize them and say it's not enough, still like there is uh, some kind of an emphasis on it. 
And uh, now finishing up with journalism, it was quite uh, interesting to see also uh, this maybe even uh, in the clearest way that uh, like all these uh, media kind of spoke in a very broad sense about technology, but now totally it adopted uh, the smart cities discourse. Um, it started talking about kind of the social issues and repercussions um, on uh, lives, uh, on our lives in our cities and how they will change as a result of technology. Um, and uh, kind of putting uh, into the first plan this question of reflections, like we should uh, reflect on uh, all these new innovations that are happening um, in our society, which was quite interesting. Um, uh, uh, yes, so now we have uh, a bit of a space uh, for a discussion. Um, and first of all, um, maybe if anyone uh, would like to uh, share some uh, insight or has any question for any of the um, for any of the speakers, any of the narratives, uh, you can write your name in the chat or write a question. Uh, and yeah, we can give you the space. Uh, yeah, and if not, I've also um, uh, uh, prepared some questions for you that maybe uh, you would like to uh, reflect on with us. Um, yeah, I see that uh, Stefano would like to take the floor. So, yeah, Hello. go ahead. Hi, nice to meet you, and thank you for the presentation. I'd like to add um, something from my perspective because I was, uh, it was interesting for me to hear about uh, Brave New World and the other uh, fiction examples. So about this <clears throat> particular depiction of technology and the fact that it was associated with control. So with a strong state or a strong society, such in the case of uh, Black Mirror, the Black Mirror episode. And since I was born in 1993, uh, a part of, of the discourse was missing, like the part uh, I feel belonging to somehow. Um, which is the internet part and the hacking part. So uh, I was in high school in, 20, in 2008 when the crisis started. And for us, I would say, um, an answer to the crisis was strongly associated with the power of hacking through Facebook. So hacking societies through you know, Facebook groups or this sort of, um, it's not about control, but it's about um, interference you can, you can make as an individual or as a, as a small part, not as, a, as the big society, you know, controlling <clears throat> so that was missing somehow and of course it's it's related to the genius Steve Jobs or this genius um, Bill Gates but uh, but differently so um, first thing I wanted to say is about this so hacking is a part of the culture and making is a part of the culture the making the makers culture came out during the economic crisis and the fixers also subculture is now emerging so there's people fixing cities or you know uh, autonomously yeah, changing them materially. <clears throat> and so I would say the key to, to how do you make that sustainable? How do you do not transform that into a, a new uh, controlling society is property. So as an anarchic would say, the only way to keep doing it is to renounce uh, property from what to do. So to not establish uh, property on your experiments or, or your hackings, which was, of course was not happening in sidewalks in Toronto or the uh, Toyota experiment in uh, in Asia. <clears throat> and so yeah, then, then you can link it or not to profit. You can leave it open source so that you get profit, of course, but you get it not from an Amazon commodified uh, uh, system, but from, from your work. So you get paid for, for what you do, whatever technological uh, level you reach. Uh, so at the end, you can be a, a genius, but uh, you're not a genius because you are a, a, an entrepreneur, as Bill Gates was. So there was no cover about the inventor of the World Wide Web. Uh, yeah, that, that was it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, that's definitely quite an interesting perspective. Um, yeah, it also seems to me that uh, like hacking is quite a nice example of like conflicting narratives because narratives is something that we've been talking about here how to see through them and uh like hacking has been maybe connected with uh very conflicting narratives about uh like hackers being uh like criminal 
Because initially, and then to like this new narrative uh, being developed of actually them being uh, like people who are taking exactly like ownership of the um, uh, of development um, and taking ownership of like these new uh, technologies um, and the internet especially, and kind of uh, prioritizing um, internet as uh, a public good that should be shared. Um, but yeah, I also see that uh, Lauren is uh, sharing in the chat. Um, uh, that the narratives focused uh, a lot on Americanized ideas about technology. Uh, do you have any comparison of how different cultures have perceived the rise of technology in society? And if it always parallels uh, this dominant narrative, or are there different uh, streams of thought we can learn from? Um, yeah, that's uh, a good point. Uh, these kind of Americanized uh, ideas, that's a, that's a fair critique. I think that uh, when we're talking about uh, at least um, pop culture and, uh, and journalism, uh, it seems to me that uh, like um, maybe uh, the language makes it uh, the easiest to kind of present uh, exactly uh, these examples that we can all uh, understand and kind of look into. But also, um, I would say that like uh, development of technology and also development of these narratives on technology has been the most uh, present uh, in these very uh, developed countries uh, like the United States. But yeah, maybe someone else uh, of the uh, prep team would like to join in on this. Yeah, I see that Teresa would like to speak up. Um, yeah, was first. Uh -huh. yeah, Bianca, feel free to go as well, it's fine. I mean, Erisa can go first, it doesn't matter. So uh, what I can share is uh, like maybe from the user perspective or like uh, how curious people are about technology, um, I can share one example. Like I'm from Germany, I'm German. I know like Germans are very like, uh like we are interested in technology but like for us it took we are always always very critical from a perspective of like uh is this data safe is it like is we are quite skeptical uh, about uh, technology at the same time uh and in comparison to that uh, i lived in russia for a while and uh like there all these new technologies like all these new AT not atms but like new technology was implemented like probably a bit later than in Germany but therefore people are way more curious people are way more like oh yeah let's try this we do this we do this and now everybody like I would say like for instance in Moscow uh, of course people were more uh, interested and more like like even older people they were more like uh, they knew how to deal with all the new technology all like paying uh, with card without uh, without putting in your pin and so on this uh, like in Germany this was was way later so I don't know if it kind of answered your question partly but this is like what my thoughts on this were now Erisa And uh, continuing on what you were saying about uh, Lauren's question, I think that of course language was a kind of a limitation in terms of finding more information about different culture, honestly. But also, what we try to do here is not really present everything about technology and smart cities, but just kind of look at some of the narratives and understand more critically on what they're trying to give us and how we should take it. So this was the main idea. So of course we're open if you guys have suggestions about different other narratives that we haven't explored here because it's it's more of a okay what are we told about different uh, ways to see citizen technology and how do we see it uh, critically what do we get from it and also uh, from uh, that was the idea behind hack auto hacking the narratives so changing the narratives basically. And uh, also based on the comment before, I'm oh, sorry, I forgot the name, Stefan, I think. Um, this was the idea, and I can personally see the hacking culture as also hacking the narratives, so changing these narratives, uh, and having more people now talking about different ways to perceive technology, and what to actually, uh, what, what to take from uh, the ways that uh, these uh, big actors or actors in the world are uh, giving us 
So this was the, the idea, and of course, it's not incorporating every narrative that is out there. Um, yeah, that was all from. Yeah, that's a really nice point, Teresa. And um, also, uh, it kind of ties in very nicely into Martin's question. Uh, I see that Martin writes, uh, I'd like to ask about what we expect from considering the narrator of the narrative. Uh, for instance, a corporate narrator uh, would promote their solutions. Think of Siemens Crystal Visitor Center in London. All the answers are um, the use of Siemens technology for policing, security, wastewater, traffic management, waste. A political critic um, as a narrator will, of course, challenge the powerful in the society. And yeah, I think that um, uh, that's definitely a good point. We can we can already kind of expect certain narratives from certain actors. And um, that's why we were also having kind of uh, examples in our presentations um, that were kind of the most representative. And we also saw a lot um, uh, very clearly uh, in Bianca's presentation uh, how like Alphabet uh, is kind of um, uh, also trying to present their vision uh, of a city that basically revolves around technology because that just gives them more business. Of course, it's in their interest, but like that's why um, that's also kind of um, why we should hack these narratives. That was the inspiration for this webinar, as Arista said. Like we should understand that um, like the different narratives exist because they're promoting um, the interests of uh, different actors. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was, um, that's, I guess, kind of also the approach that we should uh, take when uh, looking into the different discourses that we see about smart cities. Kind of just, yeah, try to be more critical, and, uh, yeah, in the way that we observe them. Uh, yeah, are there maybe any uh, uh, other points, insights, questions? Yeah, Martin says uh, the alternative technology movement was very pro-technology, but wanted technology to be designed in support of communities and sustainability. Uh, yeah, that's also, um, I believe, uh, kind of the approach that uh, we have in CDN. Um, yeah, and maybe Hanna can uh, also talk a bit about the Digital X Working Group and kind of what uh, their uh, views are also more holistically. Uh, on technology in this way. But I see that Masha uh, is lining up in the chat. So yeah, Masha, take the floor. Uh, thank you, Luca. I, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Masha. I work as CDM project coordinator. And yeah, I wanted to tell about like, how do we hack this narrative or how do we take it over? Uh, I don't know, maybe till the point when we as Greens, as Green Movement, don't start to promote uh, our very concrete vision, or I mean, we kind of already started <laughs> in regards of that, but to have it um, more clear, uh, more mainstream and more accessible for more people, that could be uh, like one of the option and you can do it everywhere. You can talk to your uh, parents or friends or you can share some movie and so on but like we should establish this kind of discourse like what is our opinion on this and we need to make sure that we have the vision not only as it is in pop uh, culture and media because okay maybe not um, journalism part but um, as you said like there are all the books or all the movies about uh, like future and technology, it's dystopia. It's not, uh, we don't have any like good example to look at, to imagine how technology can be in reality in the future in the positive way. So whatever Google, for example, tells us that this is smart city, people who have no idea about technology or urbanism, they will be like, Oh, okay, this is great. Thank you, Google, once more. <laughs> more. Uh, so, yeah, I think that should be made really clear that uh, what they call accessibility or what they call uh, political participation of people, like how is it even, it's a neighborhood, it's not a city, so uh, is Google planning to, like, affect uh, 
political policy making level uh, maybe you can also clarify what they mean uh in this moment uh, yeah it's uh, it for me sounds like a lot of beautiful words for people who just like so i don't know marvel movie and they imagine that it could be uh, like our future can be also really like with nice uh, beautiful trains in the sky, which which could be the truth, but yeah, Google is not the way to achieve that. Yeah, nice point, Marsha, about uh, like kind of asking, taking a step back and asking this question of how do we even hack the narrative, and yeah, that's a that's a really good discussion point also on whether we need our own um, kind of vision. Uh, a green vision of um, of smart cities uh, and like is it connected also I, I would say it is connected then in the, the process of creating this vision with uh, kind of being aware of the different narratives about smart cities smart cities that exist out there because um, yeah otherwise we kind of risk falling into this trap of um, uh, yeah, of taking on board narratives about uh, technologies in cities which are uh, based on very particular interests, like this one uh, of Alphabet. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, and there was, um, this was also kind of directed uh, towards uh, Bianca, kind of a clarification question about Alphabet. So maybe, yeah, Bianca, you can take the floor and then, uh, yeah. Uh -uh. I uh, don't know it in detail, but like what they were planning, like they were planning to like have some citizen participation workshops, and they're having like they're having this uh, place where like this really cool place where you can hang out and uh, young people can hang out and you can connect and stuff like that. Uh, so, but um, like I don't know any details about it, but what I can say about like. Uh, but citizen participation from experience because I've worked a while on this is like that all these big top-down projects are from my perspective not really working uh, so you really need also uh, like if you are implementing from top to down and you want to create a society somewhere it's super hard so you really always need like people who really want to change something or really want to do something and like society is creating from like people who want to collaborate it's not from somebody saying okay get together and collaborate yeah thank you bianca i'm sure that uh you still would want to join in on this also uh with some uh big growth perspectives later on uh but yeah i see that stefano uh has another point who'd like to join in thank you i'd like to add two things uh to also answer to what was said one is about scale and one is about public goods so about um <clears throat> about scale um it is interesting for me that um somehow the hacker culture is constantly um, linked to something small and something hidden um but there is like a, a new technological component of, of the hacker discourse, which is uh, now in, it was not there in 2008, so, which is uh, the collection of urban data. So social data was the thing in 2008, uh, what people had to say and stuff. And then the internet of things came. And so people and companies started to gather data about objects and about people. But so the difference is that social data is data you put there. I, I, more or less freely post something um, on a social network. Whereas if I get mapped or observed from above in a urban context, that's not data I want to share. But that's not a big problem from my point of view, since uh, you can decide uh, if to own or not uh, such data. So if it's in the hands of Google, uh, it's very different than if it's openly in the hands of a university which is collecting it and sharing it at the very same moment or right after and stuff like that. So there is a debate in Italy going on about public uh, goods. Um, universities are selling data to Google which they don't even uh, consider gathering before. So Google is coming to the university and saying, take these millions of euros to let me uh, track your students around the campus and stuff like that. And you can fight for the property of, of that uh, data, but also um, it is important, I think, as a, as a, I know, trying to hack the thing, not to stay, uh, to participate it materially, so to participate it technologically, not to uh, go away from it. Um, and then 
the fact that the data is not yours and that the data is not corporate data doesn't mean that it cannot be big. So you can you can participate it as big as you want, uh, as I see it. So big data is a thing; it, it shouldn't be ignored. And then um, about the, how do you solve the um, uh, on which scale do I apply the new rules for society? So what do what new society I, I make as a pilot? As a designer, it is quite uh, easy. The answer is quite easy, and it's uh, given by making something. So you can um, draw new lines on on a street. You can uh, realize a fake bus stop, and the bus will stop there. It happened. It was done by students in my faculty. So it is interesting that you can interfere with the city materially uh, on whatever scale and immediately. And that's what I would suggest uh, the Greens to do. And in South Tyrol, there is a group about uh, public ownership of data, the group for open data. It's part, It's mostly old people. And it, as for what I know, they overlap with the Linux user groups. And they take care in the provincial uh, government, let's say. They fight for uh, maintaining public data and the public website and the public services, uh, which are used through the internet, open. And as I see it, there's like proposals in this sense uh, ready in your work. Thank you. This was quite yeah. long. <laughs> no sorry. worries. Uh, <laughs> also sorry about the lighting. Mm-hmm. No worries. Thank you for joining in. Also, um, yeah. Also, some nice points on how we should uh, create our narratives um, of smart cities. I think I saw the order was that also uh, Justina wanted to join in and uh, then Risa, right? Yeah, hello uh, everyone, and thanks for the rest of the prep team. You did a really nice job of uh, uh, explaining the narratives. Uh, and yeah, like, Luca, you kind of asked me to comment on the degrowth, but I would like to start like what I'm hearing, uh, what we're talking about actually is like pinpointing what is missing from the narrative. And like when we make a narrative, we are missing something automatically. And that's where I think the green vision kind of comes in with. Um, because uh, what we saw from these narratives uh, today is that uh, the smart city is becoming more and more as a uh, as a goal and as a, not as a tool to achieve something. And I think with the charter for the smart cities, uh, we are trying to make kind of make a new vision, a green vision, uh, where uh, smart city and technology is rather a tool to achieve our wa- values and uh, the green and the social values that we are all fighting for um, and uh, asking critical questions of uh, you know what technology can bring to us uh, and in what manner should we use it um, and uh, and then the like really it's up for question how what values uh, more like what are the specific things that we uh, want to bring and how to use uh, social te- uh, like technologies uh, to foster more, more social inclusion uh, in a meaningful way, and not like uh, we like what we hear heard that uh, being we are really um, critical towards social inclusion in this uh, participatory manner in Google uh, or Alphabet um, projects. Uh, but like, how do we actually uh, make these uh, like social? Uh, yeah, it's a, the gap between the rich and the poor. Uh, if the rich companies are actually uh, trying to implement projects within our, our cities and trying to make it smart. Um, and yeah, again, like uh, I'm taking too much space with what we are, the question is what we are missing from these narratives in general. Yeah, nice point. Uh, and also, um, you, uh, if you look in the chat, uh, Richard dropped the link to the Smart City Charter, so you can also take a look at some uh, interesting example and reflections on uh, place of the values in this um, uh, technology development in cities. And yeah, so thank you for sharing. Um, Erisa uh, was next, right? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the discussion is really going towards the growth and donuts economy. Also, it's very interesting. I'd like to, I wanted to uh, comment a bit on what uh, Stefan was saying. I find really interesting the kind of idea on what we can do. Uh, and I think that uh, steps like uh, the more materials or design interventions, I think it's important to 
also to um, understand or to sorry to intervene in uh, also in council policies to be aware for example going back to the Siemens example that Martin um, discussed before uh, it's very important to understand it is a company center in our cities in a way so trying to cooperate with the municipality about um, on different projects about smart cities to ask ourselves as citizens or as part of different movements to uh, ask ourselves what do they really what are they trying to sell us first because we also have to consider that all, all these pop culture media uh, businesses are sometimes often sometimes trying to sell us something and this was also the idea behind uh, smart cities so we can also try to uh, not only do like this uh, interventions in hacking way, but also try to be more be active in our cities in order to uh, to raise questions about the new projects that are coming up. And I think Amsterdam, for example, I believe that there's been a backlash a couple of months or uh, maybe a year ago or something about privacy issues uh, in uh, smart city um, projects. So it's all this. Uh, so it's citizens or as part of different movements as greens we have all these responsibilities and that was the idea behind this thing to kind of raise questions to, to make yourself to, to make us raise more questions about these narratives yeah that's definitely true and i uh, i also like that we are kind of uh, moving in this uh direction like at the same time kind of evaluating the connections uh, that exists between all the narratives and uh, economy, what a strong influence it actually has on technology. Um, we'll also organize um, a webinar on um, kind of the economic and uh, financial systems in cities uh, this Tuesday um, uh, with uh, the Dutch uh, Greens, IFA, uh, MEP Kim, uh, MEP Kim uh, Van Sparentak, and also our former a uh, board member of CDN, Lisa Gutu, who's uh, working for a financial startup. So yeah, that will be quite interesting. And you can um, also uh, join in on Tuesday at 6 for this. Um, but yeah, also, um, it was quite a nice point uh, you made, Risa, about uh, the importance of these, of uh, being aware not only of these narratives, but also to try to be as grounded as possible in your local context and kind of to uh, try to have a very kind of uh, critical approach to uh, the new projects that are coming up because um, uh, it also kind of helps you uh, build experience and um, you have kind of the biggest potential like to call out the uh, like the problematic or one-sided narratives in your own context because yeah you're just aware of the um, of the background information that's happening uh yeah i see there's also some uh more examples in the chat about uh uh about technology also yeah uh, lauren mentioned the uh donut uh circular design model in amsterdam it's also something we've been talking about uh quite a lot in the in the prep team i believe there will also be a reference to it uh on tuesday um Uh, yeah, and uh, Richard is also commenting on the uh, donut model, saying that uh, it can be a source of inspiration. Uh, it focuses on the circular economy as a way to overcome the crisis, uh, but the solutions don't need to be high tech. To and uh, yeah, there's a quote from the charter. Uh, yeah, a question not to be overlooked is: Do we really need new technology? Uh, but yeah, high tech solution to a problem is not always the best one which is a really nice point, also ties into the degrowth uh, philosophy or economic model, whatever your uh, way of calling it out is. Um, but yeah, perhaps we can have some uh, finishing comments uh, since we're slowly running out of time. Uh, so if anyone would like to use this final space to uh, speak up, feel free to write your name in the chat or raise your hand. Yeah, Stefano. 
Thank you. I'd like to ask a question and to add something, like to show something. So uh, here. Nope, I cannot share my screen at the moment. Uh, what I wanted to signal, so I wanted to thanks for, for the links. Um, I would also like to add a link, ah, here. Here you have it, I'm now pasting it. The website is called New York Commons, and it's uh, a map <clears throat> of New York on which you can pin places uh, of which you don't know the ownership. And so uh, the ownership gets then uh, mapped somehow. So for each of the places, you've got uh, Street View, Google Street View, and then uh, information about who owns the place and how you can act on the place if you want. So if you, who you have to call if you want to modify the place materially. And the thing uh, which I wanted to ask Justice uh, is um, about this, because for me, uh, as a designer, the basic value would be anarchy, so non-ownership of whatever you new things you produce, and then enabling. So yeah, like giving technology to enable new actions. But of course, technology always uh, disables some, some actions. We have to learn to use it. So I wanted to ask if there was some other values, which I see here the organizer of the event um, you linked is uh, the Cooperation and Development Network Eastern Europe. So if there was something you already are uh, somehow considered pivotal for, for the um, debate, speaking of values. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, um, thanks for the question. It's not an easy one to answer, and I'll uh, like uh, my rest of the prep team also to join if uh, if you're uh, willing to. Uh, but in general, when we talk about uh, urban environment and uh, the freedom to have that we have or do not have, it really sometimes clashes with this um, smart city narratives, uh, and that's what like what we're missing here is uh, uh, like if we design everything until the last moment uh, or the last detail, which uh, the kind of uh, Google platform um, tried to do in Toronto, then we leave out the, uh, as you said, maybe uh, some part of anarchy uh, that we could bring to uh, urban space, the freedom to for the unknown, right? Uh, the urban gardening, for example, uh, if that becomes a, a kind of a social project, then um, led by or designed by uh, rules, uh, then we are quite simply uh, just uh, missing out uh, fun and the kind of unexpected interactions that we might, uh, that might bring. Um, yeah, that's in two words for me. Thank you. Yeah, nice point. Any other reflections from anyone uh, from the prep team, maybe? Yeah, um, if not, maybe I can also share that um, in general, it's been quite interesting to um, uh, to see the discussion uh, about these narratives also uh, shift to the importance of uh, kind of asserting our own vision of uh, how we see uh, smart cities and more broadly uh, technology being implemented in cities uh, and uh, it was uh, nice to see uh, like actually some of the common flows in the discussion and seeing how um, uh, yeah we do actually see importance on these uh, uh, on these smart cities being uh, community-based, bottom-up, uh, where there's a clear idea uh, of ownership of the implementation of these technologies. Um, and uh, yeah, but in the bottom line, uh, even though uh, these uh, this implementation of technologies uh, seems like a kind of a straightforward process and like a historical inevitability, um, still, uh, in, we need to see smart cities as uh, not being a goal, but actually being a tool to achieve um, uh, to achieve our values uh, more easily. And yeah, that's maybe uh, a really nice guiding principle. Also, when talking about kind of hacking the narratives, it's um, quite a nice methodology. Would be to ask ourselves, like, does this uh, specific project serve to achieve our kind of broader values and broader vision? And uh, yeah, maybe that's something that we can 
uh, finish off on. Um, yeah, I do have one final slide in the presentation. Uh, and here you can see uh, the old uh, social media um, on the uh, upper side, upper half of the slide, uh, CDN, Cooperation and Development Network Eastern Europe, uh, social media, and below uh, there's uh, Jeff uh, social media. Uh, if you haven't uh, still filled in the participants form, uh, I just dropped uh, the link in the chat, uh, so you can click on it here. Also, you can um, subscribe to Green European Foundation's uh, newsletter. Um, so, yes, I would like to thank you again for uh, coming to the webinar. Uh, and also next week, uh, you can join us for a discussion on the economy and finance systems in cities. As I said, we'll be joined by Green, CIFA, MEP Kim von Sparentag, uh, and by a former CDN board member, Lisa Gutu. And this will happen on Tuesday at 6 p.m. Uh, uh, and yes, finally, uh, this, uh, both of these webinars are um, kind of uh, organized uh, as a sneak peek into a live training that we hope to organize still later this year in Riga, in Latvia. Um, uh, and uh, the training will uh, deal with uh, um, uh, exploring in more of a broader sense uh, the implementation of technology in cities. Um, and uh, yeah, this project uh, is also organized by the Green European Foundation. Uh, with the support of CDN uh, and the financial support of the European Parliament to Jeff. Um, so yeah, thank you one last time for coming and yeah, feel free to say goodbye as well. Thank you, bye. Thank bye -bye. you, goodbye. Thank you.